Morning, Seth Shore. It's great to be with you today. Week number two, I feel like I've been with you for about a week now. Feels like a long time. Actually, it feels much, much longer than that. Feels good. Feels good. Feels good to be here. Thank you for coming. Hello to our friends on the internet, wherever you are watching from. Great to have you with us, and thanks those of you who are gathered here today. I know in the first service we had at least two families that I know who hadn't been here for a while. This was their first Sunday back. There's always something great when you go, I'm back. You know, I've been watching, maybe I've been connecting on the phone, but when you're physically back, it's a very, very cool thing. Community, the body of Christ, is so important. So it's good to have you here today. Well, thanks for leaning into the word and just to say, Lord, what do you have for us today? Last week, as we looked at Philippians chapter three, our determination was to, with Paul, say, we're about one thing. Remember that? One thing. If you were here last week, one thing. Paul was about one thing. It was to press on to know Christ, press on to the resurrection, press on to glory, to know Jesus in the way that, that he has as we cross that finish line and get the goal. That's what we're doing as a church. We're pressing on, pressing on to make him known. This morning, we're going to look at a simple text, but a profound text, and I thank you, Blair and the team, for leading us and for your prayer as we launch into God's Word this morning. Well, we're launching into this new series called Pray Big, Pray Big. I don't know if you've ever been around mountains, but, um, you know, we feel pretty puny when you're around a mountain. You go, there's some strength there. And our God is a God of strength, and prayer is powerful. Over the next seven weeks, we're going to be looking at seven messages from New Testament prayers that the Apostle Paul prayed. And the reason that's important is because it gives us words to say, it gives us the method that Paul would want us to pray, and it helps us to, to pray the heartbeat of God as he calls us to pray. And that's good. That's good. We need that because prayer is fundamental. And there's fundamentals about a lot of things. There's fundamentals about a football game. There's fundamentals about what you do in your work. There's fundamentals about how a furnace works. There's fundamentals about how the Christian life works. Prayer is to the spiritual life as breathing is to our physical life. I'll say that again. Prayer is to the spiritual life as breathing is to the physical life. Prayer is fundamental. But just beyond the fact that we need it, I want you to step back for a minute and just think, wow, I get to do this. Do you ever have that feeling in your life like, I get to do this, I get to do this. We just need to be reminded that we get to do prayer. We have the privilege of talking to communing with and conversing with and being in fellowship with the almighty God who created the heavens and the earth. And when you turn your heart to him, when you turn your thoughts to him, when you turn your voice to him, what a privilege that the God of the universe, the eternal God, the ancient of days, is listening and we get to fellowship. And then there's power in prayer. There's power in prayer. Think about the Bible. Think about what happens when people pray. Right now I got this idea of of Jericho, the walls of Jericho, right? When people pray and they march and they trust God, God moves, seas open up, walls fall down, eyes open, prison doors open, chains fall off, hearts are made new, the lost come home, lives are restored. Is that just like then? Is that like, yeah, that happened in Bible times? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's for 2020. That's right now. Same God, same power at work in us. What a privilege. Well, it's great, prayer's great, and we're gonna press into that, but if we were honest, we would probably say many of us that prayer doesn't come easy. Some of you go, you know what, my prayer life isn't doing really great right now. If I was to get a mark on it, I might be doing like a C, maybe a B minus on a good day, maybe a D on a bad day. And I, re I remember those things uh, early in my Christian life. Very early, as a Christian, I was 16 years old. I was at our high school Sunday, Sunday school class. And uh, we'd have a great teaching time. I remember there was two long rectangular tables. There was chairs all the way around the perimeter, long rectangle. Probably 13 of us in the class. My teacher's name was, was Ron Clark. He was in the army, and he had a, like a boot camp. We listened, we paid attention. And at the end of the class, every time he would close in prayer, and he would make us pray. So they would start with the person that was next to him, and then the next, and the next, and the next. And around the table we would go. And when you're 16 and your friends are there, the last thing you want to do is pray out loud. How many people remember that, right? Just remember that, like, I don't know what I'm going to say. I just, you kind of feel really awkward in the middle of your friends. So it was okay if actually you were, like, in position number one or two or three because you were right on, and you were right at the beginning, and you could pray for things like, Lord, thank you for today. <laughs> Woo, done. <laughs> 
God, next guy. So then if that was you, number two, you'd go, Lord, thank you for our teacher. Amen. And number three would probably say something, Lord, thank you for the cookies and the juice we're going to have when church is over. Amen. But if you're number four, five, six, like up to 13, it was like, wow, this is just not easy. I don't have anything left to say. <laughs> you know, like, what else is there to pray about? And when it was my turn, it felt like, hmm, silence, a lot of ums. And I remember feeling put on the prayer hot seat and how awkward it was. I'm glad that was a number of years ago. I'm, I'm glad that I've kind of passed some of those rookie days in prayer, but I understand, I remember how it feels. And many of us struggle with prayer. Many of us struggle with doing it or knowing what to say or how to pray. We struggle with uh, maybe getting sleepy. We maybe struggle with distraction. That's something I deal with. Some of us limit our prayers to just praying before meals, like we're the grace people. That's the end of my prayer life. For some people, don't even do that, but they're praying on the run. Like, um, you know, I'm on the run into my car, driving down the highway, or I'm going to school. I say a prayer and get it done. And other people are kind of the emergency-only prayers. Oop, I'm in a major crisis. I better talk to God about this. So that's a start, but let me tell you, God has so much more for us. And maybe today, as we talk about prayer, and I've been talking about, you know, how your prayer life is, maybe your blood pressure is just kind of going. Maybe you're just thinking, Lord, just tell him to close his eyes and have everybody pray, and I'm just going to kind of sneak out quietly and drive away. Well, if you're discouraged because your prayer life has been not as good as it should, maybe a little haphazard, maybe you don't really have a plan or a consistent plan, or maybe you just feel like you're just not getting good traction. Well, today I want to tell you, don't give up. Don't quit. If life is hard, if your prayers maybe have seemed to not be answered, don't quit. Press on, press through, and let's ask God together to do a new work in each of our lives and in us as a church. And I'm, I'm so encouraged in that place because Jesus understands us. He knows us. He knows our weaknesses. It says he was tempted. Hebrews chapter 4, 15, and 16 says, for we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He gets it. He knows but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So then, here's the encouragement. Don't run away. Don't run from God. Run to God. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So brother and sister, if you're feeling shame or discouragement or guilt because of your prayer life, run to the Lord. God is patient with you, and he'll teach us as you lean into community and lean into his grace. Well, for all of us, prayer is a journey, and I've been on it for 40-some years. Actually, this August was my 40th anniversary, my 40th spiritual birthday, and I'm still growing. But I want to tell you, I'm, I, I want to be honest with you this morning. I am really excited about prayer. I want to pray bigger, and I want to pray better, and I want us as a church to pray bigger and better. I want us to enjoy prayer more. I want us to enjoy being in God's presence. And I want us to be eager to pray. You know, sometimes we see prayer as a last resort. But it needs to be our first response. Have you ever had those experiences where there's a little mini calamity in your life, something happens, and you, you, know, you, you sort of spring to action, you're going to solve the problem. And so you do this and that and the other, and you try three things and try four things, and nothing works. I remember we... We were coming home from New York City once, and uh, we actually took a wrong turn. We went down a side street in the middle of a snowstorm, kind of rural Buffalo, New York somewhere. I backed up to do a three-point turn, but the backup wasn't on a flat. It, the ditch was so full of snow that it looked flat, but I backed up and the van went down, and we are now in big trouble. Snowstorm, US of A, uh, no American cell phone privilege, six of us in the car, so, you know, we're trying to push the car and all that stuff, and whatever, 20 minutes later of frustration, phone call to the towing company, and I think it was Alex or someone, I'll give you the credit for it, because I don't think I get the credit for this one, but she said, you know, why don't we pray? You get what I'm saying, right? Why didn't we pray first? Well, as it, as it happened, within, I don't know, a minute or something, some guy with a, a truck, and we hadn't seen any other cars, some guy with a truck stops, goes to the back of his truck, yanks out a chain, doesn't even talk to us. <laughs> he just hooks it up to the front of his, his, you know, his big four by four, wraps it around our front axles, pulls us out, and then away we go. 
and uh, the Lord did it. So let's not make prayer our last resort, but let's make it our first response. I want us to love praying, and I want us to love basking in the knowledge that when we pray, we're communing with the everlasting God, who is our powerful God, our personal God, and our providing God. And our love for prayer, because if we if we were honest, we'd say, you know what, sometimes I don't really love praying, but here's where the love for prayer comes, and this is it. Your love for prayer comes from the fact that you know you're praying to God who loves you, and you love him. That's where, that's where the love for prayer comes, and you're spending time with one you love who loves you. And I want to say that, that prayer is really, really big. Sometimes we think that prayer is like this little a la carte thing on the side menu. You know, you have your main dish, and the main dish is life, but you kind of bring this side dish, and prayer is like a side dish. It's a little sprinkle. It's a little flavor of, oh, we should, you know, put some sprinkle on our spaghetti because it just needs a little spice. Prayer is not the a la carte add-on. It's not the the bottle of seasoning just to kind of bless what we do. We can't think of prayer like that because prayer is a big deal. Prayer is not the add-on. It's the thing. It is the thing. It's the central thing. It's a big deal. And I'm thinking the fact today that here's what the Bible says, right? Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, they, do you remember that? They, say it with me, labor in vain. Or how about John chapter 15, verse five? Jesus said this, without me, you, say it with me, can do nothing. So prayer is not some little seasoning we put on. Prayer is the thing. It's the thing we have to do. And prayer is a big deal. We live in a a world with big needs, and we are very acutely aware of our big dependency on God. And as we pray, we have a big opportunity to bring our faith and pray big prayers before a God who is large and in charge. A God who has faithfully loved this world and does big things for his own power and glory when we pray. He shows up. Well, let's turn in our Bibles and open up with that as an introduction to Colossians chapter 4. Let's stand together as we look at our one verse. It's a simple verse, but a profound verse. And if we understand it, and if we love it, and we practice it, It will change our lives. It will change this church and it will change the world. Hear now the word of the Lord. Colossians chapter 4, looking at verse 2. Simple words. I'm reading from the CSB, so it will probably be a little different for you if you have the ESV. It says this. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Why don't you take a seat? So as we look at prayer today, Here's what Paul wants us to learn. We're going to learn how to press on to Christian maturity in prayer. We're going to learn to press on to Christian maturity in prayer. Where do I get that from? Well, we haven't had a chance to look at Colossians as a whole yet, but Colossians is consumed, among other things, about the doctrine of Christ, his preeminence, about Christian maturity, about what it means for us to grow up in Christ. And we want to grow up in Christ. And here's the first thing that Paul says. He says if we're going to grow to Christian maturity in prayer, we have to make it continual. Make it continual. Colossians, like Ephesians, has two parts to it. There's there's the doctrinal part and the practical part. There's the, just the truth about who God is, the theological part, and then the truth about how to live it out. And in the section from 3.5 to 4.6, we're in this practical part. In chapter 4, verse 2, Paul's saying, We've talked about the Christian life. We've talked about how to live out the lordship or about the lordship of Christ. Now, how do you actually do it? How do you follow Jesus and live out your faith moving towards maturity? Well, he gives us a really clear and simple answer right here, 4.2. He says, this is it. If you want to live the Christian life, if you want to live out what I've been teaching you about, this thing starts here right now. It's one word. It says pray. Pray. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. What does it mean to pray? Alex and I were talking about this, and you can have simple definitions. You can have bigger definitions. In fact, as I was thinking about this and preparing the message this week, I have bookshelves with with some of my my books at home, and I have two full uh, sections of my bookshelf, probably 60 60 or more books on prayer. So I'm going to give you a 30-second definition, but there's 59.95 more books worth of definitions on my shelf. All right, so we're going to just kind of give you a little start on this. What does it mean to pray? Simply means it m- just to talk to God. To pray is to talk to God. It means to ask. To ask God for things that we need. Um, the New C- City Catechism, 
which uh, comes from New York City, Tim Keller's church. They asked this question, and you see it on the screen. What is prayer? And their answer is slightly, slightly similar. It says this. Prayer is pouring out of our hearts to God in praise, petition, confession of sin, and thanksgiving. There was also a kid's answer. I love the kid's answer. That's great. You know when big people will memorize these long Bible verses and the kids get to say, like, give thanks to the Lord? And the parents had to do, like, five times that much. Well, here's the kid's answer. Prayer is pouring out our hearts to God. Why don't we say that together with me? Prayer is pouring out our hearts to God. You see that in Psalm 62, verse 8. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is a refuge for us. So when we pray, we're talking to God. Sometimes we're asking God for things. Many times we are. But as we, as we commune with God, as we talk to him, we're pouring out our hearts. We're in fellowship with God through this wonderful gift. I found this uh, quote from Richard Trench, who was the Archbishop of Dublin in the 1800s. He wrote this, and I think it's so helpful. Prayer is not getting man's will done in heaven, but getting God's will done on earth. It is not overcoming God's reluctance, listen to this, but laying hold of God's willingness. Isn't that good? Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance as if we had to strong arm him, you know, to kind of giving in. Like, come on, God, come on. Prayer is laying hold of God's willingness. So good, so good. Well, let's jump into Paul's admonition today. He said, devote yourselves to prayer. Make it continual. Now, you don't have to go to Bible college to know what this text is saying. Be devoted to it is what he's saying. You know, devotion, we think, I'm devoted. You know, there's a devotion in my life. There's this positive mental outlook. There's this fuzzy, sentimental feeling about something. We can kind of think that devotion is, is that. That's not what Paul is saying here. This is not this, you know, I've got this nice thought. I, I know prayer is good. I know prayer is in the Bible, and it's a nice thing. It's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying. It's not fluffy like that. It's not lip service. It's not this sentimental feeling. He's saying this. Prayer, church, being devoted to it, being steadfast in it, is prayer in action. It's doing it. It's a commitment to do it. Not just to think about it, not to feel nice thoughts about it. It's to do it. He's saying, so sure, prayer, do it. And the idea here is to pray habitually, to make it just part of what you do. Part of what you do, continually praying. Now this means, I think, two things. Number one, that we have the formal times of prayer where you, know, you go into your room, and I, I have my room set up, and you, know, you, you sit in your chair and you have your Bible and you have your, maybe your prayer journal or some prayer books, and you spend formal time with God. You might call it your quiet time or your daily devotions, whatever. That's the formal part of prayer. There's meals, that's formal parts of prayer. Alex and I will, will pray at night before we go to sleep, that's a formal part of our prayer routine. But then there's the, what happens when you, when you go, right? you're going to school, you're going to work, you're in a big meeting, you pray in the details of life, you take prayer with you, it doesn't just stay in these formal times. Other Bible translations nuance the word like this. Uh, and here's kind of the, the themes. Number one is to persevere in prayer. We're talking about being devoted, it's just talking about persevering in prayer. Like, stick with it, stay at it, keep doing it. Second was keep on praying, keep on praying. Third, be courageously persistent in prayer. Courageously persistent. And the J.B. Phillips translation says, always maintain the habit of prayer. So let's just uh, look at those and ask ourselves, you know, how's my prayer life doing? Have I seen evidences of persevering? Have, have, am I a person who's keeping on, keeping on praying? Am I being courageously persistent? Am I maintaining this habit of prayer? Paul writes the same thing in Romans chapter 12, verse 12. He says this. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. And then he says, be constant in prayer. We see this in Ephesians six eighteen as well. Paul's saying the same thing to the churches. Like He's a man of prayer. He realizes the importance of it, and he's telling the churches in a number of different spots, look, you got to be about this. Make this a priority. And this is what is to characterize the life of an individual, the life of a church, the commitments to, and the absolute importance of and practice of prayer. You know what I would love? I would love if, if you meet somebody someday and they say, what church do you go to? And you say, South Shore. I say, yeah, I heard about that church. That's in Barrie, right? And, and they say, well, tell me about the church. What's it like? And you say, 
This is a praying church. Or maybe someone hears about South Shore and says, says, I know about that church. Those people really love to pray, don't they? Ever heard of Brooklyn Tabernacle? Jim Cimbala? I've never been there. I've wanted to go there in New York City. But I can tell you one thing I know about Brooklyn Tabernacle is they have a big choir. They put out worship albums galore. But they are a faith-filled, eagerly anticipating, praying church. How many people know Brooklyn to be like that? Just put your hand up for a second if, if you know anything about them. I just know that's who they are. And you know, prayer meetings, when you call a prayer meeting, as a pastor, I've been in lots of prayer meetings over the years, usually in a church of 150 people, if you get 20 people out for the prayer meeting, you kind of go, that was pretty good, (laughs) but it's not really good. And you know, in Brooklyn, when they open the doors, I know this for a fact because I've heard the stories of it, if you're gonna go to the Tuesday night prayer meeting, you gotta show up an hour early, and they're lined up down the block. Could God do a work in us like that, that we're a, like we're an all-in prayer meeting people kind of church? That's how important it is. Prayer is foundational for all we do. And prayer was modeled by Paul. He said, you know, he's always praying. Prayer uh, was modeled by other people. We're gonna hear about Epaphras next week. The New Testament people prayed. Jesus prayed often, and he told his followers this in Luke 18. He told them a parable to the effect he wanted to teach them this, that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Maybe that's just a word that God has for you today. You ought always to pray and don't lose heart. Maybe some of you feel like your your prayer flicker is like about to be snuffed out. Jesus said, don't lose heart. Then he says this, this exhortation, this admonition. He says, I tell you, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find, knock, and the door will be opened to you. And those words in the original language are not just seek once, but seek and keep on seeking, ask and keep on asking, knock and keep on knocking. There's this, it's exactly what what Paul is saying here. He says, be devoted, be persistent, keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep doing this. And why do we do this? Because, well, we pray to a God who, who loves us, and he's not distant, and he's not disinterested, but he's the almighty God, we sang about it earlier, who rules creation and time. He's our ever present and compassionate God. He's not only just God, but he's our God. He's not just a father, he's our father. He's my father. And through what Jesus has done on the cross, Galatians chapter four, Romans eight says, we can call him, what's that tender word, Pastor Adam? That was Abba. And this term Abba, It's a term that describes this intimate relationship that a loving father has with his child, a child who lives securely in the love of God. So we call him Abba. God's our father who loves to give good gifts to his children when we ask. He's not stingy. He's resourceful. And that's who God is, and that's the God we pray to. And who are we? Who are we? Well, uh, first thing I can tell you is that we're not in control. We're not superhuman. We can't leave leap over tall buildings. We can't lift a thousand pounds. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't even know what the rest of today brings. So if God is all of that, infinitely so, we are infinitely weak and needy. We are empty, but God is the source. He's the fountain. And God has made us in a way that we are strategically deficient. We are strategically dependent and needy. And when God is the resourceful giver, we are the needful receivers. And God says, I've made you to live in this wonderful, beautiful state of dependency on me. That's just the way the Christian life is lived. His fullness in our weakness, his strength in our lack, his perfection in our limitations. As we ask, he meets our need. He gives And when he gives, we receive, and he gets the glory, and we get the joy. That's how God made us. That's how God made our Christian life to walk. A man named Terrell Jasper wrote this so well. He said, just as our life is dependent on continually filling our lungs with life-giving air, prayer is dependency on the life-giving character of God. 
That's another way we could talk about prayer. Prayer is dependency on the life-giving character of God. Everything that we do, tomorrow morning, you go to school, you drive to work, you're going to be praying, state a sense of dependency. When you know the path of courage that you need to walk, but you can't do it, you pray. And when you don't know how to, how to walk, you don't know what to do, you pray. When you close the door in the morning, tomorrow morning, get alone with God, you pray. When you drive down the road, when you walk through the, the halls of your school, you pray. So sure, this is God's will for us to persist in, to be devoted to, to be dependent on our faithful, powerful, providing Heavenly Father who loves us. So let this be our prayer. Lord, make us a people devoted to prayer. Well, after telling the church what to do, then he gives us two attitudes that we should use in prayer. Here's the first one. In our journey to press on in maturity through prayer, Paul tells the church, be watchful. Be watchful. We see that in the verse, Colossians 4.2. Be devoted to prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. The CSB says, stay alert in it. The ESV says, be watchful. Now, it may sound like an obvious statement, but if we're going to be devoted to prayer, to pray continually, we have to stay awake. And it seems like the Colossian church needed to be told, wake up. Now, have you ever fallen asleep in prayer? How many people, you want to admit that you've fallen asleep in prayer? I think it happens to me pretty regularly at night. I'm a person who falls asleep very, very quickly. And maybe, you know, you get, remember that prayer that you prayed as a kid, now I lay me down to sleep? Maybe you only get to, now I lay me, <laughs> you're gone. Look, that's it. You tapped out. Well, sometimes we can fall asleep in prayer. Maybe it's early morning and you're just groggy and you're just drifting. But the disciples did. They fell asleep on, on one night. But it wasn't just any night. It was the night. It was the night that they needed to stay awake. It was the night that Jesus warned them that they needed to stay awake. It was the night that he told them that he needed them to stay awake. He warned them in Mark 14, 38, these words, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Boy, that's a warning to us. This is a, this is a tough world we live in. Your flesh is weak, so watch and pray. And then he needed them to stay awake and pray for his sake, not only theirs. Matthew chapter 26, 38. He said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And so when Jesus needed them, when they needed it, when he needed them to stay awake and not fall asleep, they did. And if we're going to be a people devoted to prayer, we need to take this literally, physically, and spiritually. We've got to stay awake physically. We've got to keep our eyes open. We have to be alert. But we also have to be alert spiritually because there's a lot going around us. The disciples grew sleepy. They fell asleep. And just, just imagine they were sentries posted on duty, right? They were, they were supposed to be keeping watch, and they fell asleep at their post. Now, When I think of alertness, um, I think of just a a state of careful watching, a state of careful watching. We have a little dog. Her name is Hallie. And Hallie weighs about 10 pounds, but she thinks she can defeat any animal that decides to come into our backyard. So I think of Hallie, who's sitting on the ground, staring out our patio door, and she is watching for her arch nemesis the black squirrel. And I don't know about you, but where I live, there are no shortage of black squirrels and little chipmunks. So she's, she's got a lot of enemies in the backyard. And so you can just imagine, if you've got a dog like this, sitting, she is scanning, her pupils are dilated, every nerve of her body is ready to pounce if she sees an intruder in our backyard. Probably 500 times this has happened, or more. Well, unfortunately, she's zero for 500 to the, uh, to the good of the squirrel population. But she is uber-focused, and when she sees one, she starts to bark really loud. If you've ever been at my house, you'll know it. Come, come to my house, and we'll uh, put her on display. When she sees one, it's game on. She starts to bark, and she's looking up at me, and, and I'm watching this all go down. I rip the patio door open. She just rips off through the door, we have a, a deck, and she flies off the deck like Superman dog, right? She should be wearing this like superhuman costume, super dog costume. 
And she literally flies off the deck, three feet off the ground, and she runs back and forth barking. Of course, she's unsuccessful, but she's alert, and she's ready to go. And when you're alert, your eyes are open, and your ears are open, and your being is just there. And some of you are wired that way. You, you take it all in. Some of you are wired in such a way that you are just very much on alert. I imagine people who work in emergency response stuff, that's, that's kind of them. Like they're at the ready, ready to go. Soldiers are probably like that too. Extremely tuned into what's happening. You, you find that you're in a situation, you're reading it, you're analyzing it, you're scanning it, and you're ready to go if there's opportunity or you're ready to go if there's danger. And Paul gives us this alert. He sounds the alarm. He sounds the alert to the church. He says, church, be alert. You need to be like that. You need to be ready to go. You need to be giving it all you got because there's opportunity at hand. Don't miss it. But there's danger at hand. Don't be caught off guard. Therefore, keep your spiritual eyes and ears open because there's a spiritual battle going on around us all the time. We forget that. Three things that, that I have seen. You have a huge event coming up, something that's really important. And you get really sick and your mind is all just crazy because you're fighting a bad cold and you can't concentrate to prepare and then you have no voice to speak. Or how about this? There's a three o'clock in the morning nightmare. Maybe that's happened to you. It's dark, it's an oppressive nightmare, and you have to call on the name of Jesus as you feel like you're being suffocated. Or maybe you sense spiritual warfare because a friend of yours who has been married for over 30 years with a wonderful Christian wife, and who is a champion for Christ, he calls you. There's anger in his voice on the phone, and he's telling you that he's walking away from his marriage. He's walking away from his family. He's walking away from Christ. Well, those three things are not hypothetical. Uh, that was the last eight days in the cross world. And so Peter writes, church, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. This is, this is real stuff happening in real time. It's not make-believe. It's not just for Bible times. It's not just in the pages of the Scripture. Friends, the, the Christian life is not an all-expense-paid cruise on a wonderful big ship on the way to heaven. The Christian life is a battleship carving through the chaotic waters of this world in which there's spiritual battle going on. We're in a battle. We're on mission. We're serving our king in a war for souls. And on every side, we're facing spiritual warfare. Our adversary, the enemy, is crafty, but he's a defeated foe. But he is still seeking to devour us, us, our families, and he's still working to keep people blind to their need of Christ. So we're called to stay alert in prayer, not fall asleep. The days in which we live are evil. Temptation keeps knocking at my door and your door, and trials come our way, and so we will stay alert in prayer and not fall asleep. And out there, in your neighborhoods and your families, here's the good news. The harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. People need Jesus. People are desperate and dying without Christ. And so, church, we must stay alert in prayer and not fall asleep. Yeah, there's obstacles, there's difficulties, there's a war, but we serve a big God. Amen? Amen. That was a good time for a good amen. He's at work, and he answers when we pray. And so let's get dangerous. Let's get dangerous to the kingdom of darkness, and let's get dangerous for the kingdom of God. Let's be a church that is devoted to prayer, that stays alert, that stays awake. For the glory of God, let's do that. In our journey to press on to maturity through prayer, Paul tells the church to be alert, to be watchful. And here's the next thing. He says in this text, he says, be thankful, be thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer, stay alert in it with thanksgiving. And for Paul, gratitude is a big deal. It's a big deal in Colossians. Seven times in this tiny little book of four chapters, we see the word thankful or thankfulness. And he's just overflowing with thankfulness. Paul says, church, when you pray, you gotta pray alert, but you have to pray with an attitude of thanksgiving. Sometimes that's missing from our lives, isn't it? Just think about yourself. You know, we say thank you to the Lord for our food. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. But 
Maybe you're, hopefully you're really thankful last week. It was officially Thanksgiving Sunday. But how much does Thanksgiving characterize your, your attitude, your approach to prayer? How much is it found on your lips when you pray? Are you just looking around like, Lord, I just can't believe I get to be in this church. Lord, I just can't believe how good you've been. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for the cross. God, wow, you've just answered so many prayers. Is that just oozing out of you and overflowing from you? Well, Paul's overflowing with thankfulness to God for who he is and for what he's doing and for this church. We're gonna see that next week, jumping back in just his heart. But you know, the funny thing is, um, thankfulness isn't always when life is great because where's Paul writing from in this letter? Anybody know? Selah? He's writing in jail. Yeah, he's in prison. Things are not going well for Paul in terms of circumstances, right? Like it's probably not the best place you want to be, but he's overflowing and he's full of gratitude. And I'm thankful this morning. I'm thankful this morning. My heart is overflowing with gratitude because the nasty cold I was talking about a minute ago, well, that was my nasty cold. And that nasty cold was real and it was threatening me not to be here on my first Sunday. That was a bit of a drag if I don't show up for my first Sunday. So Blair and I had a few conversations on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday. It's like, is it getting much better? Well, a little bit. Had a good sleep, but mm, don't have much of a voice. How you doing? Well, a little bit better. So we had plan A, B, C. Plan C was that I wasn't going to make it. Just going to have to, like, call in sick and join you on the 18th. Plan B was like, well, maybe I can talk for a couple of minutes and someone else will have to preach. And we talked about getting someone else to preach. Plan A was that I'm going for it. God's going to raise me up. And um, praise God, the Lord gave me the strength to be here. He gave me words to say. And he gave me a voice to preach. I'm thankful. I'm thankful this morning, as I stand before you, that when evil comes to us in the middle of the night, with thoughts that overwhelm us and the feelings of dread, that when we call on the name of Jesus and sing songs of praise, that the devil goes fleeing and God covers us in his peace. I'm thankful this morning that when a dear brother in Christ goes into a sudden, expected, destructive tailspin, that the Lord moved in power. As we wept and pleaded and prayed scripture for our brother, our gracious God heard our prayers and the prayers of his wife, and brought this dear brother back from the edge, back to his senses, back to his knees, back to his wife, and back to walk in the light of the Lord. Alex and I had a chance yesterday, tears coming from my eyes, hitting the pages of my Bible. I earmarked a text that I was praying through, put this man's initials in my Bible. My tears hitting that page as we talked to them and prayed with them and gave thanks for what God had done in a week. The living God still listens to the prayers of his children, answering those who trust in him. When we pray, God's people hear. Or when we pray, God hears his people pray. And if you need a reminder today of of every reason that you have to be thankful, to overflow in thankfulness, if you need to have your gratitude tank filled up, I wanna give you four of them. Number one, be thankful for the price that Jesus paid. He's a saving God. He's gonna bring you to be with him forever. Be thankful, number two, for God's provision. He's Jehovah Jireh, and he meets all of our needs. Number three, be thankful for God's promises. He will never leave us, he will never forsake us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He's a faithful God, and we can fully trust in him. Number four, be thankful for God's people. Just look around, go ahead. Just kind of do a left and a right. Go ahead, you can do that. Just kind of look around, look around and be thankful for the people that are here. Be thankful for this church. Be thankful for your leaders. Leaders, be thankful for the the flock of God. Just be thankful for God's goodness. And finally, we just need to be thankful that we're alive in Christ. We're destined for the throne. Right, Pastor Adam? I think that would be a good spot for an amen from you. I know that's your heart. We're destined for a glorious, eternal future. This is the message of the gospel, and we have every reason to be thankful. Well, today, as I think about prayer and the importance and the privilege of it, I was reminded in 1987, I was called by the Lord as a university student to spend my summer with Power to Change. 
Uh, it was called Campus Crusade for Christ in those days, and I was supposed to go to Guyana for seven weeks and be a team leader in evangelism using the Jesus film, sharing the gospel in the country I actually don't know that I ever heard before. Physically, I probably couldn't have found it on a map. By the way, it's at the top of South America. It sits on top of Brazil. And in, in addition to raising money for my financial support, I had to raise a prayer team up, people that would stand with me and shoulder the weight and come alongside and pray with me. So I approached this lady in my church. Her name was Mary Moffat. She was a little lady. She was a powerhouse of a woman, but she was a godly woman. Have you ever known people in your life that if you needed someone to pray for, you'd go to that person, you'd go to that man, that woman, that dear senior saint. Do you have somebody in, my mind, in your mind? Well, that was the person in my mind. It was Mary Moffat. She was like the rock star, prayer warrior champion. And if I got her on my team, I knew things were gonna be good. And she, she said she'd pray for me for the seven weeks that I was away. And I know that the Lord used her prayers in powerful ways. Sometime I'll tell you the story of how God preserved our life. As she prayed and was devoted and was alert. And that, that summer was great, seven weeks in Guyana. We preached the gospel to hundreds and thousands of people. And many people put their faith in Christ. So two years later, now I'm not a student anymore. I'm on staff at this church. I'm one of the pastors there. And Mary comes up to me in the foyer after the service. By the way, foyer conversations are great, by the way. This was a great one. She said, you know, Jody, she said, you asked me to pray for you when you went to your trip. She said, I've been praying for you every day for the last two years. I was stunned. I was just stopped in my tracks. The privilege of this woman who thought enough, gave enough of her time for me to pray for me Realizing this profound privilege, the value of the prayers of this godly woman who was devoted, who stayed alert on my behalf. You know, I realize that I just, who I am today and where God has brought me, I just know that in so many ways it's because of the people who prayed for me. And you too. We are who we are by the grace of God in many ways because of the people who pray on our behalf. So sure, we are a people who prays. I'm so glad for that. But let's not be simply a church that prays like an add-on to the things that we do. By the grace of God, by the work, the powerful work of his spirit, let's be a praying church. The center, the core, the heartbeat of what we do. Let the burden and the passion and the love for prayer characterize everything we do. From our elders meetings to our Sunday morning pre-service gatherings to our worship team rehearsals to the times we come together to clean up the church or do some painting to walks in the woods with your prayer partner to outreach events, to women's conferences, to steward meetings, to elders' retreats, to youth nights, to bonfires and car rallies. Let prayer characterize us. Let it be the thing that we do for the glory of God, for the good of his people, for the taking of the gospel to the world. Let's be devoted to prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to close the service in a bit of a, an unusual way this morning. We're going to spend three minutes just reflecting on what we've heard today. Why don't you bring up that slide? Three things I want us to do. First is I would love you to memorize this verse. It really forms the foundation and the, the framework for what we're going to be doing over the next seven weeks. That's why I wanted to preach on it today. So I'd love you to memorize this. You probably can do it in about 30 seconds. Why don't we say it together one more time? Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten words. Spend a minute trying to memorize that verse. Second is reflect. How did God speak to you today through his word? And what do you need to do about it? And if you're a journaler, if, you're, if you've got a book and you've got a pen and you're writing today, maybe even write that down just as a, as a memorial for this moment, what God's saying to you. And then third, spend a minute just praying. Lord, when you're praying personally, you're saying, God, do this in me. Make me a person devoted to prayer. And then for us, for the people that you just lovingly looked around at, your kids, your friends, people you don't know in this place, Lord, make us a praying church. Why don't you go ahead and do that? And then the, the team will come up and lead us in our closing song. Oh Lord, you're so good. What a privilege it is to pray, to call on your name, the name of Jesus. Father, to come boldly before your throne of grace. Lord, do this in me, do this in us. Lord, make us people devoted to prayer. 
to the glory of Jesus for your good purposes and your good will in this earth in the days in which we live. All God's people said, amen.